Hey there, Nick Dudetakis here. In this video, we're gonna go over how to record great sounding and high quality audio at home. With remote working being so popular nowadays, this is a really nice skill to have. It's not just limited to folks doing live streams or YouTube videos and things like that. It really applies to anyone. For example, you can use the tips that we're about to go over for remote interviews, code pairing, talks, podcasts, live streaming, YouTube videos, creating courses, basically anytime you wanna sound decent uh, over the internet. So. This video is unlike most of my other videos because this one, I ended up writing a blog post first and it ended up being 11,000 words long. And it's not public on the internet yet, so you can ignore this uh, URL up here, but I will leave a link to it in the description and it will be available by the time you watch this video. But I figured, you know, since we're dealing with audio, it would be really nice to be able to hear like before and afters and maybe visualize some stuff. So that's why I'm making this video. And uh, you know, there is a lot of stuff to go over here, but I'm not just gonna narrate this blog post word for word. You can kind of think of this video as being supplemental to the post. Uh, hopefully by the end of this video, you'll get the TLDR on the whole post. You can always come back here and fill in the details, but uh, you know, I'm kind of sort of treat this thing as like an ad hoc presentation. So before we get into this, yeah, TLDR about myself, not important at all. Just wanna let you know that since about 2015, you know, I've made a whole bunch of video courses and things like that. I've recorded like 400 videos. I also run a podcast. There's been 70 episodes so far. You know, I do some live talks and I do a lot of like freelance work where we're doing uh, like screen sharing because, you know, if you're new to this channel, I am a software developer. But again, none of this stuff really applies to software development when it comes to high quality audio. So throughout this process, right, of the last five or six years, uh, I've done a lot of research in this subject, right? I probably spent at least 75 hours just researching various audio things, right? Like hard settings and a whole bunch of other stuff uh, to help really produce clean sounding audio. And uh, that's what we're going to cover in this article. And, uh, you know, as a software developer, uh, even if you don't really plan to record videos, you know, as mentioned before, this is pretty useful to know. And uh, just a heads up, you know, this is not going to be another video or blog post where it's like, oh, hey, by the way, go buy the 750 bucks worth of audio equipment and I'll make millions of dollars in affiliate sales. Like, no, 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 nothing like that at all. Uh, most of these tips are actually going to apply to anyone with any type of audio setup in any home environment. You won't have to do any expensive sound treatments or spend any money in most cases. But with that said, you know, we're totally going to focus on hardware as well, like headphones and microphones and other hardware gear. And, uh, you know, if you want to do an upgrade or two, then feel free to use my suggestions or, you know, you can do your own research, whatever you'd like. Right. So and just a heads up, like, you know, some of these things, it just might be as simple as 70 bucks for a really good microphone and you're off to the races. Other times, you know, maybe it's like, well, could be like a thousand dollars. Right. And uh, anywhere in between. But uh, yeah, so in general, you know, high quality or good sounding audio comes from a combination of quite a few things. So uh, really, um, and this is not in any specific order, right? Like the room that you're recording in, pretty important. Also being able to control ambient or background noises. And we're going to go into the details about all this stuff, by the way. There's also the human element, right? That's you, like how you speak, your positioning, awareness of doing certain things. And then also there's your audio gear and software. Focusing all of your energy in one spot really isn't going to give you the best results, right? There's a really good balance to all this. So that's why dumping like 750 bucks on a whole bunch of audio gear, it's kind of pointless if uh, there's a whole bunch of low hanging fruit that can be fixed in other areas. But uh, before we get into all of these bullet points here, let's go over some rapid fire tips. So this is kind of like the TLDR version of combining all the elements there above here, the bullet points. And, uh, you know, I do run this running in production podcast. Again, if you're not a software developer new to the channel, uh, this is a podcast where I talk to other developers every week and we kind of just go over their tech stack, lessons learned, stuff like that. Not important for this video, but you know, I do have a guest on every week and they're not audio engineers, right? Regular folks using whatever microphones they have. And, uh, these tips came from a list that I used to send them out as like a show preparation note. So, you know, this is not going to apply to everyone in every situation, but these tips are pretty useful. Like, for example, you know, if you can try to find a quiet room, if you have a massive, big open room with like very little furniture, hardwood floors, high ceilings, this can create a lot of reverb without having a good microphone setup. And, you know, if you are in a scenario like that, we'll go over ways to uh, make this room a little bit better. In fact, uh, what you're listening to now is me in a very, very bad room for recording. Like I have almost all these things here and I didn't spend a lot of money to make it sound uh, fairly decent. 
So also, you know, disable all types of sounds from your phone. And really, you know, these tips apply to if you're recording something or giving a talk or, you know, something like that. If you're chatting with your friend, then I guess it doesn't really matter that much, right? But yeah, disable sounds from your phones, maybe even put it into a different room because the vibrations, especially if it's sitting on your desk, then it is going to be super loud over the mic, assuming you have a mic just sitting like right next to that, right? Uh, also turn off notifications on your computer, right? So you don't get startled or distracted by something unexpected. Uh, also, it's totally worth shutting down most things on your computer, bef uh, computer before you go on to recording because things like your CPU and disk IO could get stolen by other applications. This can even be an issue if you have a really good machine. Also, if you're standing on a hardwood floor and have flip-flops or something like that, slippers, then uh, try not to shuffle your feet around because that will make a lot of noise. Also, if you're sitting down, like by the way, I am standing, but if you are sitting down and you have a very, very squeaky chair, uh, probably a good idea to switch it out for a different chair, just temporarily in case you can't find a new one or something like that. But uh, yeah, those crazy uh, obnoxious chairs in the background, they can totally kill a recording. Also, be mindful of your clothes in relation to your desk and other things, right? If you have like an unzipped jacket or a hoodie, uh, you can totally just like smash a water bottle with your arm by accident and uh, fling it off your desk. Like I've done that like literally half a dozen times uh, just doing remote calls because you don't really think about that stuff, especially when you're standing. Also, be mindful of your mic rubbing against your collar or your shirt. If you happen to use something like an earbud and a mic combo, or you happen to have, you know, like a clip-on mic, this will create a whole bunch of stuff like brushling, crackling, distorted sounds that are very, very, very hard to edit out later on. Also, try to avoid wearing things like a track shoot, uh, track suit or a shiny jacket or a shirt, because if you adjust your arms a lot, it's going to cause a lot of rustling sounds. Also, beware of your headphones cable, right? If it's constantly moving around on your desk, it's going to definitely come through over the mic. Also, be careful not to rip it out if you have a chair and then you accidentally roll over it. Been there, done that, at least uh, back when I had a sitting desk, right? Also, be mindful of things that can turn on or off on their own, like air conditioners, fans, fish tanks, and super loud computer fans. Uh, if it's safe, you should probably turn these off if you can and then turn back on after the recording. And we'll go over how to address things like computer fans uh, a little bit later on. Also, be very mindful of your breath, right? Try not to be super uh, mouth breathy into the mic because that will come off pretty weird. It's gonna gross people out. But um, yeah, just something to be aware about, right? And we'll go over some tips on how to control this later. Also, if you have a window in your room, uh, definitely close it, right? Because there's all sorts of outdoor noises that are going to get heavily amplified if you do have an open window. Uh, also, do you have any pets that can potentially make noises? You know, if you can, maybe put them in a separate room without putting them in danger because, uh, you know, Pets are going to be pets. And also, if you do put them outside your room, you know, if they go crazy and start scratching at your door, you know, maybe try to find an alternate solution if you can. Also, if you have children uh, that could potentially interrupt you, I don't know, maybe if you have a partner or someone or who can maybe just hang out with them for an hour or two or however long you need to do your recording, that is a really good idea. Also, if you have children or large pets that are going to be running around like maniacs, like blow you above you next to the recording room, you know, that may cause vibrations and other noise that uh, your mic is going to pick up. Also, be mindful of doing laundry because uh, this is one where you don't really think about it until it happens, but depending on where your room is in relation to your laundry room, if you happen to have one, uh, dryers and washers are very, very, very loud and they vibrate a ton. And depending on how your house or apartment is set up, you know, it can actually just resonate up through the walls and just vibrate everything and come through to the mic and it's going to sound uh, pretty weird. Also, if you have any roommates or someone living with you, give them a heads up, right? And ask them not to like smash garage doors or just slam doors. You know, those things can come through uh, depending on how they happen. It could be pretty easy to edit out. But again, if you're giving like a live presentation, you want to be mindful of that. Also, be mindful of potential ticks. You know, some folks will just spam click their mouse or maybe tap their fingers on the desk or something like that. All these things can totally kill a recording. And, uh, you know, if you happen to be doing a podcast with me, like, you know, we'll, if I notice that, I will call you out on that. And then we'll just stop and, you know, re say things if needed. It's not really a big deal at all, right? But just something to be mindful of. Also, if your neighbor is going to throw a party during a scheduled call, maybe worth reconsidering. Uh, I had this happen during the podcast too, where uh, someone was living in Taiwan and there was all fireworks going and it was going crazy, right? So if you know that your town is going to do parades and fireworks or like you have scheduled uh, landscaping services with like those stupid freaking obnoxious leaf blowers or maybe a tree cutting service or maybe your town is repaving the road, you know, totally worth it to reschedule if you know that's going to happen at your scheduled time. Also, if something unexpected happens, right, like a loud plane, helicopter, train, fire truck, sirens, 
then uh, try to finish your sentence and keep talking, and then we'll just wait it out, right? Uh, eventually, you'll figure out uh, what your microphone picks up and doesn't if you get a little bit serious about this. So, you know, there's ways to combat that without it being uh, kind of annoying, right? And then also during long stretches of talking, uh, be very aware of your system going to sleep, right? That's if you're not typing anything or not moving your mouse. Maybe after 10 or 20 minutes, things are just going to go idle. Maybe your monitor will go, will go to sleep, right? So move your mouse every once in a while. Totally helps. And, uh, you know, try not to type unless you have to because key presses, they can be very, very loud unless you have a, a pretty solid recording setup. And we are going to go over some tips on how to minimize keyboard sounds later on as well. Also, if you have really good headphones, be mindful of them because uh, they can actually be so loud that the person who you're talking with can echo out from your microphone, uh, microphone like right into the microphone that you're speaking into. So like right now I'm not wearing headphones, but imagine if I had headphones like right here and the sound coming out of that, it's going to go right into the mic and it's going to cause like, uh, like an echo effect, almost like if you had speakers instead of headphones. Also, this one is pretty obvious, right? But don't eat or chew gum. Uh, you know, you, this can create all sorts of like alien mouth noises. And we'll go over that, uh, this phrase a little bit later and, and what that actually means, but you probably get the idea. Also, you know, the sounds of like bags wrestling or cans opening, that can be really tough to edit out, especially if it happens while someone is speaking. Uh, and also do stay hydrated, right? Drink plenty of water uh, or whatever you want, right? And if you have a sensitive microphone, maybe just turn your head to the side or something like that. Again, this stuff is super easy to edit out later on if you're doing like a pre-recorded call. And uh, as for the restroom, you know, even if you don't have to go, it is totally worth going right before an important recording. Uh, with that said, at least with the podcast for me, you know, if you have to go, you have to go. Just say, hey, I have to go to the bathroom and we'll pause and that's it. It's not going to be a big deal at all. Uh, also, if in a podcast scenario and you go crazy coughing or sneezing or something like that, probably best just to ignore that it happens because if it's a pre-recorded show, very easy to edit that stuff out without everyone, anyone ever even knowing that it happened. You know, if you're doing a live talk, use your best judgment, right? Uh, so now those are general tips, right? Things to be aware of and how you can address some of them. But uh, let's go into more detail, right, on how to improve the quality of everything, right? And that really starts with that first bullet point, like which room you decide to record in. And uh, this is pretty important. You know, there's, you know, like I say here, like you can make some or most home offices and bedrooms sound very good, but certain rooms are going to be much easier to get a good sound out of, right? A bad sounding room is going to have a lot of reverb or echoing, and it's going to be located near... Uh, you know, something really obnoxious, right? Like a loud, busy street, or maybe in a basement if you have a furnace kicking in pretty often during the wintertime. Like that stuff is really hard to block out. And then also like, well, what's the opposite of bad? A good sounding room is going to have like really no reverb at all. And it's going to be positioned in one of the quietest areas of your living space. And uh, well, it's kind of funny. This is like a chicken and egg problem. I have a link here to listen to a side by side comparison, which uh, I didn't record yet. But let's throw that up in the video now just so you can hear what that sounds like. Hey there, Nick Janathakis here. Sorry in advance if things sound a bit echoey, I just moved my home office into a new room, and right now there is a hardwood floor, a very minimal desk, and absolutely nothing else. So it is an echo, echo, echo chamber. Now in this video, we are going to go over uh, some of the source code to the Build the SAS Apple Flask course, but if you don't have this course or you're using a different web framework, then it's no problem because the same things could apply anywhere. Pretty interesting, right? So the room definitely makes a difference, but there are things you can do to help get things under control. And uh, there really is no perfect formula on what makes a room good or bad, but there are some characteristics that typically make things sound better or worse. So my current recording setup, right, is in basically one of the worst possible rooms for recording, but I made it reasonable enough, right? It's not the best right now, but it's pretty good. And honestly, if you don't have really, really, really good headphones, you probably wouldn't notice any difference. But I only spent, I don't know, maybe 60 bucks here with pre-made items that you can find at Home Depot or on Amazon. And again, this is not about being cheap or not spending money. Like that's really all that it took, even in a really horrible room. So uh, here's some common things, right, about uh, what you can do to make a room sound better, you know, based on what room that you're in. So a room that is smaller, basically like 5 by 9 in feet or 6 by 10, it's considered a fairly small room. Uh, smaller is better in this case. Also, if you have a carpeted floor, you know, basically anything better than that really cheap basement carpet that's like a millimeter thick, then that definitely helps a lot. Having a bed in uh, your recording room is, oh man, it is, it is absolutely the best. Uh, it just really, really, really absorbs a lot of sound. Also, if you can open up your closet doors and you have a whole bunch of hanging clothes there, that's another really, really great uh, source of easy sound control. 
uh, then, you know, you know, if you're not in a bedroom or something and you don't have a bed in there, uh, any type of real furniture helps a lot too, right? If you have like a couch or chairs or beanbag chairs or uh, whatever, you know, anything like that helps a lot. Also, if you have like a multi-layered desk with shelves and books and stuff like that, uh, books are another great way to reduce a lot of reverb. Uh, anything, you know, basically to break up the room shape helps as well, right? If you have plants or typical clutter, right? Typical clutter is different for everyone else. If you're one of those crazy hoarders, maybe like a hundred stacks of newspapers, you know, that would be great, but probably wouldn't look so good. But you know what I mean, right? Typical household stuff. But notice here though, nothing on this list is weird or like specific to making things sound good. It's basically what you would expect in a normal bedroom or a home office or stuff like that. Things are very easy to obtain. Now, let's go over the opposite of that, things that make a sound or a room sound worse, right? So a large room typically is a little bit harder to deal with. So, you know, that's 12 by 14 feet, maybe 14 by 18. Just by the way, the room I'm in right now is 14 by 18. It's sort of, you know, pretty big and pretty empty. Uh, if you have angled walls or really tall ceilings, again, that could be pretty tricky because it just bounces uh, or the sound waves bounce around everywhere. So in this room here, I do have angled walls. Also, if you have hardwood floors with like no area or throw rugs, that can be uh, a little bit tricky too. And you know, the room that I'm in now, and we're going to go over like what that looks like pretty soon, by the way, uh, it is hardwood floors and there is a tiny area rug that I put in there, but uh, now I'm getting ahead of myself. But uh, you know, just basically having four hard surfaced walls, like if you don't have closet doors that you can uh, open with with uh, clothes and whatnot, you know, that can be pretty echoey too. Well, technically reverby. And then also, if you have like a really, really minimal desk that has no backside, you know, that which is pretty typical for like a standing desk, you know, it's also doesn't help. And then uh, just overall minimalism, right? Not having any furniture, plants, shelves, clutter, things like that. Again, big open spaces are the enemy when it comes to creating nice sound. But again, you know, these are all pretty common things. Like you're not going to move out of like a different apartment or house because you happen to have all these things. Uh, but by the way, before we get into um, remedying these things, like how can you make a bad room sound better? Let's just do a TLDR, right, on how sound uh, even works. And the TLDR is sound waves travel through air and water and they vibrate individual atoms along the way. This uh, wave makes it, makes its way into your ears and then your body takes over from there. Uh, that just means like when you're talking in a room, like sound waves are bouncing all over the place. You just can't see them because they're invisible. You can almost think of them as light waves, right? But they're sound instead. Uh, and that's also why there's no sound in large empty regions of space. There's really nothing to vibrate off of. But uh, when you have a whole bunch of hardwood floors or concrete floors, sound is reflecting and bouncing off all the time. And it's going to continue to do that based on the loudness of whatever you're uh, producing, right? Like if you're speaking or yelling or clapping, it's just going to get reflected a bunch of times. But eventually, after enough reflections, it's going to completely die out. But again, hard surfaces reflect sound more. But then you have the opposite of that, right? Like beds and carpets and clothes and stuff like that. And that just does a really, really, really great job at absorbing these sound waves. Also, you know, as an aside, that's why if you shout or clap loudly in a room, that's not ideal for recordings, then that reverb is going to get amplified. And also, if you happen to do that, like in a mountain range or a massive canyon or a long concrete tunnel, then you can hear an echo too. And by the way, if you're curious, like what the heck is the difference between a reverb and an echo, uh, this article here it does a really great job at explaining that. Basically, uh, your ear or brain or whatever can't compensate for the same exact sound being repeated uh, in a specific amount of time. Basically, the TLDR says that reverb is reflected back within 100 milliseconds and your ear cannot distinguish the perceived sound from the original sound source if that happened within 100 milliseconds. So echoes tend to get noticeable after about 55 feet, 17 meters, due to the speed of sound. So basically, you know, in a long tunnel, you'll hear an, hear an echo because it's probably going to be longer than 50 feet. But inside of a room like this, like 14 by 18, you're not going to necessarily hear an echo because, uh, you know, the sound's going to travel fast enough where it's going to be under 100 milliseconds. So now the good stuff, right? Like how the heck do we make the reverb and echoes or whatever go away in a room? And, uh, you know, this is what's my current uh, room is right now. Like, you know, perspective is weird, but I'm standing in front of this computer workstation and uh, the webcam is pointing towards that desk on the right. And uh, yeah, uh, let me scroll down here a little bit. And well, I said here, like if you didn't watch the video because I'm literally recording it now, so it's a little bit weird, but you can see I do have this uh, five by seven area rug here, basically in the middle of the room. It's a little bit pushed to the back because I like standing here on the empty hardwood floor. And also I bring this chair around when I move my desk down because it is uh, adjustable. Um, but this little area rug, it actually makes a really, really big difference uh, to reduce the echo in this room, or I should say reverb technically. Now, 
Uh, I didn't link the specific rug that I have because honestly, I just grabbed it from Home Depot one day quite some time ago. Uh, it doesn't even have the brand on it. I cut off the tag. I lost the receipt. I paid with cash. Like, yeah, a whole bunch of reasons, but it doesn't really matter, right? Just find uh, a pretty decent area rug on Amazon for 30 bucks. Again, when I say like, you know, go and buy this, like you don't need to go and buy this, right? There's other things you can do first before purchasing anything. But if you do, then, you know, you can click this link and then just go and search for rugs on Amazon. Uh, the brand isn't important really for audio reasons. Just don't get one that's like a millimeter thick. Try to get one with something. I, I guess mine's maybe like a, um, like a quarter inch thick, something like that. And uh, it's going to help a lot. So here's another perspective shot of the room. Uh, to my left, there is closet doors, or there are closet doors, and uh, that created a situation where I had four hard surfaces, right, uh, all sides of the room, and this little mat here, well, technically, it's like a moving blanket, I just rigged it up here with, like, <laughs> uh, the shower curtains, and this really, really helps, so between having uh, this along with the area rug, uh, super beneficial for my room, and this is pretty hardcore, right, like, you're probably not going to have to hang moving blankets somewhere to make your room better. But again, if you have a really uh, poor room like myself, then maybe that's a, a reasonable idea. It doesn't look the best, but like, what are you gonna do? So I can even like scrunch this up to the side so you can't really, uh, you know, it doesn't block the doors, but whatever, it is what it is, sorta, basically. And by the way, you know, you can grab these blankets, 30 bucks, four of them, Amazon, cool. So, uh, you know, I just went on to say here, like it doesn't look the best, but sometimes you have to do what you have to do. And in my case, if I didn't have this hanging here, just the area rug alone, too, it didn't work, it was too bad. And if I just had this by itself with no area rug, also didn't work too well. So combining both of them uh, really made a huge difference. And it's still not perfect, but it is definitely good enough. And also, by the way, like if you can't mount shower curtains and brackets on moldings and stuff like that, you know, maybe you can nail them to the wall or use like really, really strong tape because these blankets are kind of heavy. So a heads up on that one. But, you know, I wrote here like probably not gonna need to go that far. You know, my room was especially difficult. Uh, difficult. Also, placing things in the corners of your room helps a lot, right? Little things, even like having a backpack. It can make a pretty uh, small difference, but everything adds up. Also, plants are another good option. Uh, they can even be fake, right? If you don't have good sunlight or, um, you yeah, know, it's, it's hard to get sunlight in some corners, right? Um, I also tried putting up a whole bunch of cheap acoustic foam panels. I'll throw up a screenshot of what that looks like here in the video. But uh, it didn't really have that much of an effect. You know, maybe things got 10% better, right? It's very hard to quantify an exact value. But they also looked like trash because uh, they just clashed with the room a lot, especially with angled walls. It just really didn't look good at all. And I really went all out with these panels too. Like I didn't spend a huge amount of money, but one of my friends used to install sound treatments professionally for both home studios and large recording centers. So we hopped on a Zoom call one day for like an hour and I took my webcam, the one that's pointing at me now, and it kind of like moved it all around the room. Like we started marking off the areas to where we should put it based on like how sound's going to reflect and a lot of trial and error and it just didn't really uh, work out that, that nicely. But you know, your mileage may vary. Uh, they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes and colors. And honestly, with a lot of setups, they look kind of cool. So, you know, as a last resort, if nothing else uh, works, then it could be worth uh, investigating that if you'd like. You know, sometimes room acoustics are just really bad, right? Uh, I was thinking too, like, if I were to add more things to fill out the room and break its shape up, that will probably make things even better. But honestly, again, you know, things are okay enough for now. Uh, probably will throw in some plants here just as, you know, I, I kind of like plants, you know. Maybe I'll have one real one by the sun or by the window, uh, which you can't see, but it's off to my uh, right here. And the other ones, maybe a couple of fake ones. We'll see, right? And also, like, I wouldn't apply this to my room, but another option is if you have a really large window or maybe like a side door, if you're recording, I don't know, in a living room or something like that, then you could use really large curtains made of material, right? Like blackout curtains to help cut out uh, the reverb on one wall, right? Instead of having four hard walls, like something like big blackout curtains can do a really, really nice job at just uh, blocking some sound. You can also look kind of cool too. It depends on your setup. And like, uh, like if push came to shove here, I can always take those extra moving blankets I have, put them in like a movable rack, and then sort of just like position them uh, to my sides out there, outside the scope of the webcam. And you would never see it, but man, it's gonna kill the whole aesthetics of the room. It's gonna look really dumb, and like I just don't want to deal with that. Um, and there's also the idea of like setup and teardown. Like like every time I record, I don't want to have to do like 15 steps, right? I just want to flip my mic on and record and be done. Uh, that's going to help me be productive, record a lot of videos and not have to think about this stuff. So that's always something to think about too. So now you might be thinking like, well, how do you make a decision? Like what do you buy? What do you don't buy? 
And, uh, or even when it comes to the room itself, right? It's like, it really depends on how much you care about the audio quality, right? It might be worth recording in one room over another, but sometimes you have no choice, like depends on your living conditions, right? If you're in an apartment with like a studio and you only have one room, then it's like, that's the one room. Although that's probably gonna be a great case anyways, because your bed's gonna be in there and it's gonna be uh, really awesome for sound. Now, understand too, this is all very incremental stuff. Like you don't need to do everything at once. Um, honestly, in a lot of cases, unless you're really, really, really far into uh, like the bad spectrum, probably not gonna have to do a lot. But uh, if you do need to take these steps, right, to make your sound uh, better, definitely do it one step at a time and try to find a balance, right? Patience really is the key here. It took me about a month before I got things in a decent state. That's mainly waiting for shipping and trying things out. Now. Let's talk a little bit about ambient or background noise. Uh, these are things like computer fans or, you know, kids in the background or, uh, you know, things that just make noise, right? That's continuous, like low noise. And uh, we covered a lot of stuff to be aware of in those 25 tips, right? But uh, we didn't really go over how to address some of those. So in programming, we have this phrase called garbage in, garbage out. And this really applies to uh, audio quality as well, right? If your source is coming in noisy, like you speaking into the mic, then your output is going to be bad too, unless you take time consuming and non-optimal steps to reduce this noise. Now, we are living in a day and age where machine learning is a thing, and there's definitely software and hardware out there that will use machine learning to help reduce background noise. But, you know, like for example, there was some crazy videos on YouTube where, uh, Barnacles had, and I'll link the, to this one because it's really funny, right? He had like a leaf blower going like in his room and this machine learning thing, like it cut it out and it worked really, really well for what it was. But this always comes at a cost, right? It's gonna manipulate your natural speaking frequencies and the less uh, processing you have to do, the better for sure. Now, there are things like hardware and software, uh, noise gates, and we're gonna go over this in, in way more detail when we talk about that stuff a little bit later on, but a noise gate basically, it just helps reduce the sounds of things that you might not want, right? Like your computer fan or laptop fan or whatever, or maybe an air conditioner, or maybe it's hot in your room and you have a fan on, you know, stuff like that. But again, this is like the machine learning setup where it's just gonna cut out some natural speaking frequencies and that is going to affect the way you sound. So when you wanna do this stuff, like the less you can do it, the better. And uh, you know, like most things in life, a healthy balance is really, really good. So for example, you know, maybe you do need to use a noise gate, which I definitely have running right now, by the way, but it's at a fairly low setting, so you can't really, it's not like clipping out my voice in like weird ways, right? But again, uh, less is better. And uh, yeah, we're gonna talk about this stuff more uh, in a little bit. But the moral of the story is, if you can really easily reduce some of this background noise and stuff like that, then it is going to improve your input signal, which is you speaking into the mic, which is going to create better sounding audio in the end. Now, if you have a desktop computer, and there's a section here for you know Apple and laptops as well, but if you have a desktop like me here, I have just a desktop workstation. I built it up from parts over the years. And uh, if I were to do it from scratch again today, I would absolutely, for sure, all of my case fans would be Noctua fans. Uh, these are very, very, very quiet fans. They really run uh, at very good RPMs, right? It's not a case where uh, the fan is just running lower, like uh, RPM wise, making less noise. They actually run uh, good RPMs, it's gonna cool your system down, and they are very, very silent. Now, a little bit harder to deal with would be the power supply of your computer. Uh, if you've never built a computer before, you know that's where the plug goes into, but typically they have really pretty fairly loud fans, and you really need to search for the very specific types of power supplies that have silent fans. Um, so you should definitely research that. I, I provided a link here to click. Yeah, again, it's like an Amazon link there. You can go and check out some stuff. And by the way, speaking of Amazon links, yeah, most of these are affiliate links, but if you don't know who I am, uh, I am not one of those guys just looking for affiliate links, right? Like I literally wrote an 11,000 word article and spent like six years researching this stuff. Like, yes, there's a couple of affiliate links. It, it helps a lot. <laughs> but, uh, and these are all things that I've done or used for years. And yeah, it's not just like spamming for affiliate sales. Anyways, uh, yeah, when I put together my next burst station, definitely gonna have Noctua fans all over the place and the most quiet power supply I can find. So uh, over the years, one of my fans uh, did die in my case, and I did replace it with a Noctua fan, and the difference was night and day. But my machine is still uh, kind of noisy because there's two other fans that aren't Noctua fans, and my power supply sort of has like a whine to it. Uh, I don't know, it's like five years old. Eh, whatever. One day I will upgrade my machine. Now, if you have a, a laptop, doesn't matter if it's Apple or something else, uh, their new M1 CPUs 
pretty damn interesting, right? Like, I don't know if I would buy an M1 right now. I'm not really uh, into Apple stuff, so I am not the right person to ask about that. But what I do know is they are very fast and they don't have any fans. So not, not having fans is really, really nice. Also, you know, if you have a laptop, maybe you can dock it away a little bit further away from your mic. That's gonna help cut out noise too, in case you don't have an M1 or you have some other, you know, like Windows laptop or whatever. Uh, so now let's talk about another bullet point here, which is the human element, AKA you. And you have a very big influence on how your recordings turn out. You know, in that tips section, you know, there is a uh, bringing awareness to things like your clothes and hands and cords and ticks. But there's all sorts of other human elements around creating decent sounding recordings too. You know, these are things like how lo loud or soft you speak, your breathing, staying hydrated, which by the way, I've got some water over here. And also besides staying hydrated, you know, there's things like how you position yourself uh, relative to the microphone. And that's also going to depend on what mic you have. And we'll go over how to position yourself properly, depending on what mic you have in a little bit. Now, for a lot of folks, you know, it takes a lot of practice. And I still feel like even after doing hundreds and hundreds of videos, uh, it is really unnatural for me to speak into a microphone. I don't know, maybe for others, it'll just come naturally. Now, I tend to speak faster and louder while recording. I don't know why, that's just how it is for me. Maybe it's nervousness, even though technically I'm not really nervous because I can just stop this video and no one would ever know that I recorded it. But uh, it does wear out my voice if I speak for like, you know, like 45 minutes straight. It's not gonna like get to the point where I lose my voice, but it definitely sounds different from the start. So that's something to be aware of, right? Try to speak as if you're talking to a friend from across a table uh, in a casual conversation, right? Or just chatting with them, standing them, uh, sitting next to them at like a normal distance. If you don't have any friends, then uh, talk like you would do when explaining your programming problems to a rubber duck, rubber duck debugging. Uh, if you're not a programmer, not gonna get that. But if you are, you know exactly what I mean. Uh, of course, don't include the rage-induced shouting. Now, speaking casually and naturally into a mic, yeah, way harder than it sounds. I think it's partly unnatural because you really need to trust the gain on your microphone as being like a part of your vocal cords or diaphragm. You know, you don't need to speak louder to make your recordings output louder. You just turn the gain up on your mic. So you are definitely way better off just speaking in a normal casual conversation and then raising the gain on your mic. But uh, don't raise it too high because otherwise you are going to start to get some distortion. And we'll go over that and like what clipping is and other terms a little bit later. Now, if you're not self-conscious enough, there's breathing too. And this is going to depend on what mic you have, but you should try to eliminate hearing drastic breaths. Now, in my opinion, I think it sounds really good and natural to keep low key inhales and breaths in, but it sounds very bad if you constantly hear someone ejecting gale force winds from the nostrils, or they happen to be a mouth breather, right? It's gonna totally kill a recording. So if you have a mic that's expected to be a couple inches from your mouth, like which is what we see here, then it really helps to offset the mic just a little bit so that your nostril air doesn't go straight into the most sensitive part of the mic. And that's what I'm doing here as well, by the way. And uh, the same goes with air exiting from your mouth, right? Having your mic just a little bit offset makes a world of a difference. There's also something called a pop filter too, and that's going to help reduce bursts of air that hit your mic when you say certain words, but we'll go over that a little bit more later on. Now, alien mouth noises can also be an issue. You know, this is where it sounds like you're positioned inside someone's mouth, right? And you can hear every spittle of spit crackle between their teeth or the cilia move in their esophagus every single time they swallow, right? This is some weird, crazy, like ASMR stuff, right? I mean, I'll do it now, but be warned, it's gonna sound ultra disgusting, but I'm only gonna do it for a couple of seconds, right? But it's like, like those type of noises, right? Like who the hell wants to listen to that for 45 minutes? Like, no. No, 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 no. And this stuff really gets amplified, right? If you have a dry mouth. So don't forget to stay hydrated. Also mic positioning, uh, it plays a really big role in this, right? Like if your mic is meant to be, I don't know, three or four inches from your, from your mouth, but you decide to put it one inch from your mouth thinking, hey, if I go closer, maybe it's better. Uh, don't do that, right? Those few inches make a big difference. Also avoid being a bobblehead, right? It's really easy to forget that you're recording sometimes and you just start moving around, especially if you have a standing desk, right? Like now I'm kind of shuffling around, moving around a little bit, but I'm trying to be super aware of where my mouth is, right? I may be moving my shoulders like this or maybe I just raised my leg, but I try to keep my mouth, you know, within an inch or two at least of where it should be. So uh, yeah, just be aware of that, right? Especially like leaning back, like leaning back is the worst, right? If I start leaning back like this, you know, suddenly you start to hear the reverb in the room and things are getting a lot uh, less in volume, right? That can be very weird for, you know, if you're doing some presentation, right? If no one can hear you, that's gonna be a problem for sure. So 
Those are basically the things that are mostly free, right? Being aware of certain stuff, addressing certain things in a room, keeping yourself in check. But now let's talk a little bit about audio gear and software. And there's a lot to go over here, right? We're going to go over microphones, headphones, pop filters, and everything that we see here. And uh, really hardware, it comes down to what your expectations are, right? Someone who live streams or maybe records videos, you're probably going to end up investing a little bit more into your hardware than someone who just wants to hop on a remote call every once in a while to talk with a coworker. But high quality doesn't always mean expensive, right? I've jumped onto calls with clients who just had a built-in mic with their MacBook Pro, and honestly, it sounded really good. It wasn't like an, uh, the best thing in the world, right? But it wasn't enough to be distracting. But before we cover microphones, let's first talk about headphones. So, see no evil, hear no evil. Really good Gene Wilder movie if you haven't seen it. Uh, but he plays a deaf man, and this has to do with recording high-quality audio because your hearing plays a very big role in being able to record things accurately. So, headphones make a huge difference here, and, you know, if you can't hear yourself properly, then you're missing out on potentially a ton of audio imperfections and issues. I remember when I had some really low-level, like, budget Sennheiser headphones from, you know, 2015, and I recorded... Uh, one of my first courses, I really didn't know the value of good headphones. And there were all sorts of weird sounds in that course. No one even once brought it up because I have a feeling most folks just have like earbuds or whatever headphones, not paying attention to like every little detail like uh, you would criticize your own self. But, you know, you can hear things like crickets in the background during the summer. Uh, yeah, stuff like that. And you're just not going to hear that stuff with um, crappy headphones, right? Um, so Sony MDR V6, honestly, the best headphones I've ever used in my entire life. And I'm going to skip ahead here a little bit and just say that bad news, by the way, I don't know. I bought them in 2016. They were 80 bucks. Best 80 bucks I ever spent when it came to like audio stuff, right? Uh, I'm really big into music and I play the guitar casually. Man, it was such a big difference. But today, for whatever reason, they're freaking 350 bucks. And I think that puts them into a different bracket where I probably wouldn't pay that much uh, for them today. But uh, the good news is there is... Another model by Sony called uh, the MDR-7506. And based on the internet, uh, and I say suppo supposedly similar here, because uh, I haven't used them firsthand, the 7506, but some folks say that they're identical to the MDR-V6s, except for the plug. But others claim that they actually sound quite different. Um, here's what I know, though. Uh, if I were buying headphones today, I'm going to buy the 7506 without a doubt. Like, no question about that one. You know, they have an 85% five-star rating on Amazon, which is insanely high. 85% uh, on just five-star five reviews, incredibly high. And also, a ton of studios use them. Like, there's really no way you can go wrong. And if you have other headphones, you know, don't worry about it. The reason why the 7506s are considered very good, or at least the MD, uh, MDR V6 is one, is because they have a very neutral tone. So a lot of headphone vendors, they'll just jack up the bass to make certain types of music sound better, but it's not gonna give you an ac accurate representation of your sound. And by the way, uh, I have a link here that has like a, another 5,000 word article on, on just comparing a whole bunch of different headphones. So feel free to check that one out. You know, I'll leave links to all the stuff in the description. Don't worry about, uh, you know, trying to copy paste stuff from the URL here, just manually typing stuff. Anyways, yeah. No point even listing out other headphones. You know, feel free to do more research if you don't believe me or explore what's out there. Uh, V6s are probably like the personally, for me at least, like the highest rated products like I ever purchased. Uh, I don't know. Again, I just wrote here, it's probably because uh, I'm so big into music, but you know, I, I've reviewed uh, computer monitors as well. Nothing ever made that big of a difference to me. And by the way, I know there's like a whole deep rabbit hole too about using studio monitors. These are basically speakers like uh, aimed at professionals instead of headphones for checking your recordings. But honestly, you know, if you're doing home recordings like live streaming, screencast, podcasts with a guest, Zoom calls, et cetera, et cetera, you're absolutely going to want headphones so your speakers or monitors don't echo back into your mic. That drives everyone crazy. So that is playback. So now that we have playback handled, it's time to talk a little bit about recording. So one thing to consider when it comes to microphones, and that's uh, what recording is about, is if you're going to be recording video or not. So you might not want the mic to show up in the video frame, or maybe it's okay to be slightly visible, or maybe you don't care if it's just in, you know, in plain sight in the foreground. It really depends on your style of recording. Honestly, for me, I'm totally cool with it being just a little bit in frame here. You can see it just a little bit uh, below my chin. You know, it's not blocking my face. It gives a pretty decent balance between quality and being out of frame, uh, given the type of mic that I have. So these styles of microphones typically come in two flavors. We have dynamic mics and condenser mics. And I prefer dy dynamic mics, and we're gonna talk about the difference soon. Uh, honestly, I think for most programming videos, like gaming streams, remote podcasts, and things of that nature, 
Uh, dynamic mics are really good because you're mainly sitting or standing still and the mic isn't a huge distraction. But if you're moving around a lot, such as doing hardware reviews like Linus Tech Tips, or you know maybe you typically have a few folks on video at once, like doing a, a group podcast, then different types of mics might be uh, useful, right? There's a lapel mic. You know, these are mics that clip onto your shirt or maybe under your shirt and you really can't notice them. Then you have shotgun mics and these are typically uh, aimed above the frame of the video and they just aim down at you like a gun almost, right? Like a shotgun. And it just aims uh, basically at the subject. These are also very good as well, but uh, you know, this video would never end if I went over like lapel mics and shotgun mics and all of them. So I'm going to really focus on just individuals recording in a stationary place, which is really going to focus on just dynamic and condenser mics. Now, there is another guy on YouTube called Curtis Judd, and this guy is an audio and lighting and video expert. Uh, I watched a whole bunch of his videos. I learned a ton from them. Uh, I really appreciate all the videos that he's made. He's not an affiliate or a friend or anything like that. He just happens to be someone else making videos on the internet. So definitely check out his videos. If you wanna learn more about lapel mics or shotgun mics, uh, you're not gonna be disappointed with his stuff. But just beware that a really good lapel mic or a shotgun mic is gonna run you a lot. It's like 500 bucks, 1500 bucks is not uncommon to get sound quality that uh, it's pretty similar to like a $70 dynamic mic, which is this mic that you're listening to right now. And by the way, if you're curious what I use for lighting, I have this uh, one adjustable LED floor lamp. I'll throw a screenshot of that one up so you can take a look at it if you want. We're not gonna focus on lighting, but uh, it is pretty cool. It has a remote control. You can adjust uh, the intensity and the color warmth. Uh, it's also adjustable in height. Uh, I'm pretty happy with that one. So dynamic microphone recommendation, uh, which is what I use. So dynamic mics are really, really good because they are very position and direction oriented, which means, you know, even if you don't have an ideal room, then you are going to get great sounding audio. Typically, they expect you to position your mouth a couple inches away, and they do a great job at not picking up sounds that aren't close to that. For example, if it's summertime and you have crickets outside, it's probably not going to pick that up. It's also probably not going to pick up planes and helicopters or even sirens to some degree. There's been times where ambulances were about, I don't know, two, 300 feet away. You know, like I live in like a residential area and they do not come through the microphone. Really, the only thing that does is like really, really loud fire trucks and, you know, maybe a helicopter that's like really, really low just flying over. So I really recommend dynamic mics because for most bedrooms or home offices, you know, you're probably not going to have expensive uh, acoustic treatments and almost certainly won't be soundproofed. And there's a difference between that, by the way. So before we get into microphones, let's talk a little bit about the TLDR between acoustic treatment and soundproofing. So acoustic treatments are things we've talked about already where, you know, the end goal is to reduce reverb. And that could be all sorts of different things. You know, we covered all that stuff uh, before, right? Household items, uh, curtains, rugs, beds, whatever. But soundproofing is totally different. That is blocking sound from entering or escaping a room. Whereas, uh, you know, acoustic treatment or acoustic treatment has absolutely nothing to do with this, right? Soundproofing is typically done before you finish building a room. Because one of the main ways to do this is actually to create double walls and you fill the gap of the walls with really, really thick fiberglass and other materials. You know, something like this is a really big structural change and it is easily going to cost thousands of dollars. So that's why I prefer dynamic mics, right? Instead of soundproofing a room, the microphone itself is designed to not pick up unwanted sounds to some degree. And that's pretty, uh, you know, common for what you might expect in a typical neighborhood. Uh, shotgun mics, by the way, are also really good with rejecting off access noise. You know, that's not you speaking into the mic, right? Things from way off to the side or in the background or something like that. But uh, let's stick with dynamic mics for now. And this is the one that I use. It's the Audio Technica AT2005. And uh, it's about 70 or 80 bucks, really it depends on the current demand, right? Prices always fluctuate. But here's why I think it's awesome for a whole bunch of reasons, right? Spending 70 or 80 bucks really isn't that bad to have uh, a really uh, a really good setup, right? And it doesn't require a dedicated preamp, so you're not gonna have to buy additional hardware because it doesn't really need a lot of power to turn it on, it just connects over USB. It also has an XLR connection, and we'll go over details about that in a bit, but just know that you can do both. And it comes with a really long USB cable and an even longer XLR cable. It also doesn't weigh much, which you might think like, well, what does that have to do with anything? Kinda has to do with a lot, right? No, well, not a lot, but it definitely is noticeable, right? The lighter mics are a little bit nicer because you have more flexibility with uh, using different types of stands. It also comes with a stand, although probably not gonna end up using this one, and we'll go over that uh, on why not pretty soon. It also comes with a clamp if you wanna connect to third-party stands, 
And as you can see here, there is a, uh, a switch that you can turn on and off. So if you just connect it straight to your computer, then you know if you're paranoid and you just wanna keep your mic off all the time unless you're using it, then you can just flip the power off. There's also like a little blue LED there that you can see. Now, as for not needing a preamp and its low power requirements, uh, let's talk about that a little bit later, but for now, understand that that is saving you about 350 bucks. Honestly, in my opinion, the AT2005 is pretty much one of the best dynamic mics you can get when you factor in a whole bunch of different things like sound quality, cost, and upgradability. Right? It's not going to be the best mic ever, but it's pretty damn good when you factor in all the stuff here. And the last one, the upgradability, is really interesting because it means from day one, you can just connect it straight to your computer over USB. And if you decide later on, you know what, maybe I want to do some hardware processing or whatever, then you can just switch, uh, switch over to the XLR connection. I mean, personally, I have mine connected over XLR with a little bit of other audio gear, but that gear is mainly there because my room is so bad. And, you know, there's noise from my computer and a lot of reverb and stuff like that. If I had a better room, I honestly think I could get away with going straight over USB with no other uh, gear or software modifications. Uh, if you're curious, I recorded my whole entire Dive Into Docker course, and there's a link to the intro video here, using this mic straight into the USB port with no additional hardware. Uh, I just cleaned up the audio a little bit afterwards with a software noise gate. And, uh, you know, I'll just loop in now, maybe like five or six seconds, so you can give uh, a hear to what that is. Hey everyone, Nick Genetakis here. Thank you so much for checking out Dive Into Docker. Okay, and to give you another example, uh, one of my podcast guests wanted to buy a mic because they plan to do a lot more recordings in the future. So I recommended this mic to him, and all he did was connected it straight to his computer over USB and didn't even have to mess with his room at all. And uh, here, I'm gonna open up a link here and play this for about, I don't know, 30 seconds or so, and you can just listen for yourself. So it starts uh, with me talking for a little bit, and then it goes straight to him. 1080p, 720p, things like that, and also handle the streaming? Yeah, exactly. So um, there's a couple different products that Mux has, and this one you're describing is what we call Mux Video. Yeah, that sounds really good. Uh, Dylan over here, no adjustments at all. So I mean, I can see here, like I'm jealous, right? His setup sounds really nice, and I didn't even touch his audio afterwards. I just imported it directly as it is. Honestly, I think it's uh, just a combination of having a very quiet room, and his voice's natural tone just mess ver uh, mesh very well with the AT2005. You know, it's really, really balanced, right? It doesn't sound too thin or too boomy. And I think that's an important thing to make a, a distinction about now, right? What mic sounds good for someone might not necessarily sound good for someone else. But I do find in general that AT2005 has a pretty good hit rate for sounding good with a whole bunch of different voices. Uh, I've had mine since 2017 and I'm really happy with it. So, you know, if you're happy with this mic and you happen to be following along by uh, scrolling through the blog, you can just click here to jump over to stands because we're done. But if you want to look at some other mics, there's the Shure SM7B. So this is uh, the granddaddy of dynamic mics. And uh, you know, this is the mic that Joe Rogan uses. Uh, it's about 400 bucks, depending on uh, the current day. And honestly, I have a feeling a lot of folks in the podcast or live streaming industry, they kind of default to using it because they saw Joe Rogan use it and now it's gained a uh, kind of critical mass, right? Where everyone sees everyone else use it, so they use it. Now, I'm not saying, you know, everyone's just a poser and they're just following Joe Rogan. Uh, clearly, they did a lot of research on this microphone because it is a really, really good mic, right? It's not just like, oh, you know, everyone uses it for the sake of it, but it's really crap. No, it's a really, really good microphone. Um, like the AT2005, it's a dynamic mic, but unlike the AT2005, it accepts only an XLR connection, and it also requires a lot of power to make it sound nicely. Uh, that means at minimum, you're going to need an a uh, USB audio interface that connects an XLR cable from your microphone to this USB interface, which then connects over to your computer. You know, we're going to talk about this stuff in more detail later on, but a decent one's going to run you about 120, maybe 180 bucks. And the preamp on this USB interface, it's not strong enough for the SMB, uh, SM7B, so you're going to need even more hardware. Um, the best bang for your buck is going to end up being about another 200 bucks because that's gonna act as both a preamp and a processor. Again, we'll talk about this stuff a little bit later. But, you know, you add like, let's say 150 plus 200, that's 350, plus the mic itself, you know, now we're out 750 bucks. The mic is also really heavy, so you're gonna need a pretty decent stand for that, another 50, 800 bucks, sales tax, and before you know it, you're at like $900, right? That's a much bigger investment than 70 or 80 bucks for the AT2005. And in my opinion, the SM7B, 
it really doesn't sound that much better when someone else is casually but professionally speaking into it, right? It's gonna sound better to some degree, and really it's not so much that it sounds a lot better, it's just a little bit more forgiving than the AT2005. And we'll get to, uh, into that in a second here. But, you know, one thing that SM7B does have over the AT2005 is it comes, in, uh, it comes with a built-in pop filter, which helps remove plosives, which are words like popsicle and test. Basically, words that cause you to push air quickly out of your mouth. But you know, for the AT2005, yeah, you can totally just throw in like a $15 pop filter and uh, have some control over that, as well as do certain things to cut out plosives. But I can totally see why Joe Rogan took this mic. Um, you know, having a really big pop filter in a camera view, because he does video as well, uh, it just looks really weird, right? And his guests aren't professional audio engineers. It could look a little bit intimidating having like a massive pop filter right in front of your face. So the SM7B uh, also is really, really forgiving when it comes to positioning. And it does a better job than the AT2005 for cutting out uh, off-axis or un unwanted noises. So there's definitely that. But in my opinion, honestly, the 2005 here does a pretty good job at rejecting unwanted noise. And if you watch a couple of Microsoft compar uh, comparison videos on YouTube by professionals, I think the difference, uh, it's not really that big, right? When you compare both of them side by side in like a blind test. Now, with that said, if you wanna use the SM7B, don't let me talk you out of the mic, right? If you wanna drop 900 bucks or whatever, do it up. Uh, I just think in most cases, starting with an $80 mic is a lot safer than going for the $900 version. You know, especially if this is for a business that you're not too sure about, right? Like lots of different folks could be watching this video. You know, maybe you wanna start a podcast or start doing YouTube videos. Uh, I don't think it's worth just spending 10 times the cost if you're not even gonna be sure that you're gonna be using or doing this like six months from now, right? Or let me put it another way, right? Like I can buy this SM7B right now, but uh, I just choose not to, right? It's not because I can't afford it or I'm cheap or whatever. I just don't think it's like a 10X difference, right? Most people are just not gonna notice the difference. And for the 1% who does, then, you know, it's not like we're comparing uh, nails on a chalkboard versus like the most beautiful sound that you've ever heard. You know, it's more like having your web server respond in 15 milliseconds instead of 20 milliseconds, AKA it's not really that big of a deal. Now, you know, tens of thousands of folks have taken one of my courses and I haven't gotten one complaint yet about the audio quality in such a way where the SM7B would have fixed it. So that's kind of why I haven't upgraded. Now, let's switch gears here and talk a little bit more about other types of mics, like a condenser microphone. So condenser mics are really good at picking up sounds in great detail. You know, very, very faint whispers. Uh, it has really good fidelity, right? If you have a very quiet room, then they can be really, really good, but they're also gonna pick up a lot of more unwanted noise than a dynamic mic. Uh, you can also keep them a couple inches from your mouth, but you know, if you have a good room, you can keep them as far as even a full arm's length away, and it's still gonna sound really good. And when it comes to condenser mics, uh, if you've ever researched mics before, you've probably heard of the Blue Yeti. It's a pretty popular mic. Uh, I actually had one for over a year. So this one will run you about 120, 130 bucks, really depends on the demand. Uh, it connects over USB on the standard edition, but they do have a pro edition that has both USB and XLR, but the pro edition is 170 bucks. Now for reference, I bought the regular model back in 2016 and I did use it for one of my courses, but I stopped using it because it was just a little bit too sensitive. It's gonna pick up like mouse farts from across the room, right? It picked up a ton of outside noises, every plane was picked up, random kids making typical kid noises outside. You know, it caused me to have to do more work. Like I had to go back and stop the recordings, go back and like re-record many, 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 many different lines. So that's kind of why uh, I stopped using it. Also, I had to use a really strong noise gate for that one because my computer fan hum just went uh, straight into this mic. It just didn't do a good job at rejecting that sound. But I also, you know, Back then, I sort of had no idea what I was doing, and I also used maybe too many effects, uh, like my voice, in terms of processing effects, but I don't think that had anything to do with the noise gate at all. You know, just a lot of sound went through. Anyways, I don't think the Blue Yeti is a bad mic. Uh, if you do have a very quiet room, and you don't want to be right on top of the mic, then it actually is a really reasonable option, and I would recommend it for that. Now, with microphones out of the way, and by the way, there's way more microphones too, but you know, at some point you have to limit this, right? Uh, I honestly think that you can't go wrong with a couple that I mentioned. Feel free to do more research if you'd like. But now with mics out of the way, let's talk a little bit about like pop filters, like plosives and windscreens, right? Uh, if you've read everything up or watched the whole video, then I did mention, you know, the SM7B does have a pop filter bi uh, built in, and we went over what plosives are, right? These are words like when you say push or breakfast. And pop filters work by being positioned in between your mic and your mouth, and they come in all different shapes and sizes. Uh, they help absorb the air coming from your mouth produced by plosive words. Uh, back when I had the Blue Yeti, 
um, I didn't have a webcam and I used this Dragon Pad pop filter here and it's about 13 bucks and it really easily latches onto any mic. Uh, it definitely worked, but you know, personally, I'm not a fan of using one that big when you have a webcam because yeah, it's just really, really, really distracting, especially if it's right in front of your face. And if you pull the mic far away enough, then it gets to the point where uh, the air is just going to diffuse naturally. Like there's no point even having a pop filter. And also for a dynamic mic like the AT2005, uh, it's really, really, really important to get a handle on your plosives. So, you know, if I keep the AT2005 directly pointed at my mouth, then you're going to hear all of that. So to combat that without having a big pop filter, you can do a couple of different things. Firstly, I position the mic slightly off axis for my mouth. So the hot point of the mic, like right into where it picks up the most stuff, is not aiming directly at where my mouth is. So I'm actually pushing air above the microphone right now when I speak. So it's not going straight into it. You know, if I go straight into it, it's kind of like that. Totally different sound. And if I start talking like breakfast, pop, a boom, a boom, boom, you're going to start hearing that stuff a lot more. So just screwing around with the axis of the mic versus your voice is going to make a pretty uh, big difference when it comes to handling things like plosives. And that's kind of like what I said about here. Now, on top of the microphone, I do have a thing called a windscreen. So it was about eight bucks and you put it on top of the mic. And honestly, it's not even flush against the tip of the mic. I left about an inch there of puff to uh, help slow the air down. Uh, this might sound a little bit weird, but do you see this? It's giving a little bit, like I can actually push that in because uh, you know I just bottomed out on the mic there. But uh, yeah, it just helps absorb the air just a little bit better. Uh, it's one of those things where it probably makes like a 15 or 20% difference, but for a couple bucks, I think it's worth it. Again, that's what I was saying here, right? Uh, it didn't make a drastic difference, but it helped. Now, I will say this though, before we move on to the next part, you know, it, it did take a little bit of fiddling to get that good mic position uh, to eliminate plosives, or at least make them a little bit more minimal. Now, let's talk a little bit about microphone stands and keyboard rumbles. So, if you use the built-in stand that comes with your mic, chances are it is going to be like a little tripod or, you know, something that just sits on your desk. And that's going to be a problem for two reasons. Uh, with a dynamic mic, it's probably not going to be high enough to be close to your mouth. So you may want to put a couple books under it. It's going to look weird. It's going to be a little bit flimsy. And uh, also, if it is sitting on the same plane of existence as your keyboard, that is going to cause all sorts of issues as well. So vibrations are really, 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 really bad when it comes to recording. So if you have your mic right next to your keyboard, then chances are the mic is going to pick up all those vibrations when you type. You know, even if the keyboard keys were completely silent, then the vibrations are going to be very apparent, right? It's going to be like a herd of elephants. And, uh, you know, a quick hack that you can do to reduce that keyboard rumble, which I've used in a pinch a couple of times, is to basically double or triple fold a bath towel under your keyboard. That's going to absorb all the vibrations. But yeah, I mean, that's kind of ridiculous, right? It's not a long-term solution. Uh, it makes typing weird and unnatural because it's going to be all wobbly. But uh, yeah, it also involves a whole setup and tear down process where you have to like put the towel there, then take the towel off. It's just not good at all. So if the towel is not good, then we need to do something else. And that's where a boom arm comes into play. So one practical way to solve that is to use an adjustable boom arm. This is where you basically connect the mic to a movable arm and then you can attach this arm to something that's not connected to your desk or maybe a different level of your desk. So this really depends on your desk setup, right? In my old setup, which is what the screenshot is, I had the boom arm, which is this over here, attached way off to the side on a different level of my desk, or I should say a different level of my keyboard, right? Notice my keyboard is down here, but uh, this boom arm is connected somewhere else. And also that is the uh, Dragon Pad pop filter sitting there. I also moved the mic way off to the axis that came in a lot from the side. It did pretty good, uh, but, and by the way, that's called like, I don't even know how to pronounce this one, like the Niwer boom arm, like Niwer, something like that, 14 bucks. Uh, it worked pretty good, but this is where uh, mic weight comes into play. And by the way, that is the AT2005. Um, you know, the SM7B, the Shure is gonna be a lot more heavier. So this type of specific boom arm, probably not going to work because it's just gonna make it like droop down on its own over time because it can't support the weight. Uh, so you will need to get a little bit more sturdy of a boom arm. I linked one here, 35 bucks, not really a big deal. You can also search for other ones as well. But with the new setup that I have now, where I have this like FlexiSpot adjustable standing desk, it only has one desk surface. And we're gonna look at screenshots of this soon, by the way. So, and, and I'll just show you right now. Like this is the new setup. Like right now I am delivering uh, this video with the setup. I'm standing in front of that workstation. There is a stand and uh, that is this stand over here, by the way. It's also 25, 20 bucks, depends on the time of day. And uh, it's really nice because it comes with a whole bunch of different clamps and it also adjusts from three to five feet 
which is 90 roughly to 150 centimeters in height. And the boom, which is the horizontal thing here, then that thing, that thing can be extended all the way up to 27 inches or almost 70 centimeters, right? Uh, depending on what your setup is like, you can make it lower, like for example, if you're sitting down instead of standing. But uh, even here with a standing desk, it's sitting here, you can't really even see it. Uh, that's kind of why I, I like it as well. And, you know, earlier we were talking about like setting up and tearing down, like it's kind of annoying having to do this, uh, that type of stuff to record. But for me, honestly, it takes a legit four seconds to get into the recording position. I also only record while standing up. So I'm not always fiddling with the height. It just basically sits there off to the side. And I just move it a couple feet over when I want to record. Also, uh, sorry in advance for the, the quality here. I actually turned the light on and uh, it just blew out the exposure because I have a really bad camera. But anyways, when I'm not recording, right, I just take this whole mic unit here, I just move it a little bit to the left and all the wires stay connected uh, and that's it. So if you can't mount a boom arm to your desk or some independent wall, then this is a really, really great option. If you find yourself typing while doing a lot of um, talking, right? Screen sharing with uh, doing code pairing and whatever, I'm probably going to be typing a lot. Now, I've been using this specific one for about half a year now, and it's been really, really, really good. So I haven't had to go back and like adjust the height or the boom arm at all. Like it doesn't droop down, uh, really nice. But if you get the Shure SM7B, you know, the mic is a lot heavier. I don't know if this stand is going to do well. Uh, you may need to just try it out. And for perspective here, the AT2005 mic, you know, it weighs like nine ounces, 266 grams, but the SM7B, 1.7 pounds and 766 grams. Like that's a very big difference. Um, so this little thin pole here, you know, you can imagine if this mic were heavier, it could start drooping down on its own. Uh, that wouldn't be good. So what stands out of the way, let's talk a little bit about USB audio interfaces. And this is basically just a piece of hardware that lets you connect microphones and instruments to your computer over USB, headphones as well. Uh, basically it acts as a sound card. And like I say here too, yeah, it has a headphone jack. So certain models, they're going to let you monitor your voice in real time. And you can toggle this behavior on and off, like if you have headphones, pretty handy. Uh, personally, I don't like to record with headphones on because it throws me off hearing myself, but some people really do want that, so that's available. Uh, and if you have an XLR only microphone, you know, this is something that you'll wanna buy. So it's compatible with all that mics that we talked about today. And if you end up using the Shure SM7B, you will also need to supply additional power, which we'll cover soon. But the audio interface that I prefer using is the Scarlett 2i2 uh, third gen. So they, there's a solo variant and we'll get over that in a few. Basically, uh, internally wise, they're both the same, but you know, the 2i2 has uh, a couple more inputs, but eh, let's get into that in a bit. Um, yeah, so this one, uh, the third gen 2i2 is about 175 bucks. And a lot of people do like this model, but it has a pretty good sounding preamp. You know, that's the thing powering your microphone. Uh, it's really easy to control the gain. That's this little knob here, the green one. You can just, you know, it's like any volume knob, right? From uh, zero to max. It also supports uh, that real time headphone monitoring if you'd like. And the third gen has a really sturdy USB-C connector. So there's USB-C in the back, but it has, uh, well, at least comes with USB-A on the out. So it goes straight into your computer's USB. You know, you can always get different uh, connectors if you need it. Uh, prior to the third gen, uh, the second gen one, it didn't use USB-C in the back and it was like a really, really flimsy connection. Uh, also the cable that comes with it is really short. It's basically just uh, over, well, I should have put three feet, three inches there, sorry. I'll fix this typo before uh, I post the article. But yeah, it's like one meter long. It's a very short wire. Uh, we'll talk about wires later on too, so on how to replace that one. So the 2i2, it does come with two XLR inputs. So if you ever decide to do a two-person podcast, you'll be able to hook up two individual mics. There's also the Solo, which is 120 bucks, and it has one XLR input jack. If you happen to be a musician, both the 2i2 and the Solo will let you hook up one microphone and a guitar to it or some other instrument, uh, which is pretty cool because I do casually play the guitar. But the 2i2 will report or will support recording an instrument in stereo, whereas the solo does not. But the preamp that powers both models, they are exactly the same, which means microphone recordings are going to sound identical. Uh, honestly, at this point, if you know for sure you're going to be only doing solo recordings, I would recommend the solo. Uh, the reason I didn't get that one and I got the 2i2 instead uh, that's because I bought it during the second gen era, and uh, there were differences at the time with certain internals that made the 2i2 a better choice, but with the third gen, that is not the case. So go use that extra 50 bucks in saving towards whatever else that uh, you want. And by the way, Focusrite, they're the company, uh, they're pretty cool. So I actually had connectivity issues with my second gen uh, way back before it had the USB-C connector, 
and sometimes the signal would drop and I'd have to plug it in again to fix it, right? It happens uh, pretty frequently, never while I was recording, but usually it's like I go AFK, I come back and I have to like reconnect it. And uh, even three months after the warranty expired, they shipped me a replacement. And I kind of half jokingly said like, hey, by the way, could you just ship me a third gen? That would be amazing. Thank you, maybe, possibly. Um, wow, see that voice is cracking. Need to stay hydrated. There we go. So yeah, uh, they actually did send me the third gen and I tweeted this out back in July. So I've had this third gen now for, you know, quite some time, right? Eight, nine months, whatever it happens to be. And uh, it's been super stable. It hasn't missed a beat. I keep it on 24 seven. I never had to uh, reconnect it because it dropped. Uh, there are other audio interfaces out there, by the way, uh, that are in the same price range, but honestly, I would not bike shed over this decision. So I spent a lot of hours researching this and it always comes back to using the Scarlett. Also, it is compatible with Linux too. And by the way, with the AT2005, I do keep the gain on the Scarlett, you know, this left uh, knob here at about 40%, but this is altered by another piece of hardware I use. So don't take that value as being correct. You know, it's really gonna depend on a whole bunch of other variables, which we'll cover soon. But I figured I'd add this here because you know, you might be wondering like, hey, what settings do you use? And that's really the only important one. Um, yeah, so now let's talk a little bit about preamps and processors. A preamp is what powers your microphone and a processor allows you to modify the audio in many different ways, such as applying a noise gate to help reduce low volume background noise. But it could also do things like add a compressor, a de a basic EQ, et cetera, et cetera. And a hardware processor will do all of this in real time and send the output over to your USB audio interface. So from your computer's point of view, it really doesn't need to do any work, right? The audio is already coming in perfectly clear uh, as opposed to doing uh, audio processing software where your computer is doing all that work. Now, you can buy a preamp and processor separately or you can buy them together. You also don't need either of them if the 2i2 or you know the Solo, the Scarlett, uh, provides enough power to your mic and you have a quiet room. You might just not need that noise gate at all. Uh, but what does a processor actually do? So beyond just applying a noise gate, a processor can do a whole bunch of different stuff. Like for example, a de helps reduce a very harsh like S or SH sounds like shuh. Uh, it basically reduces sibilance, right? AKA high frequency sounds. You know, some folks naturally have more sibilant uh, voices. Also an EQ can help raise or lower various frequencies in your voice, right? If you have a very high pitched voice, you know, maybe adding a little bit of low end bass is going to make you sound a little bit better. Although typically the less audio effects you do, the better. Uh, they manipulate and sometimes even remove natural frequencies from your voice. So you don't want to go overboard. Then you can end up with like weird, like robotic jaggy sound. It's like kind of hard to explain, but you know, you'll start hearing weird, like mechanical, uh, mechanical wispy sounds and other artifacts. But when used in moderation, uh, processing effects can make a notable difference. Uh, that goes for a compressor too. So a compressor is going to help level out your volume. And besides a noise, noise gate, I would say this is the second most important thing. So if you speak softly, like I am doing right now, it is going to increase the gain of your mic. And if you speak really loud, like a maniac, which I'm doing right now, then it is going to reduce it. And uh, that really ensures that folks will always be able to hear you without constantly having to fiddle with their volume if you start to get energetic or decide to whisper a little bit, right? Uh, also, it's going to prevent you from clipping. So clipping is when uh, things just get too loud and the computer doesn't know what to do or whatever is processing the sound and things are going to start to get distorted. Like you definitely don't want clipping to happen. Also, applying too much of a compressor isn't really that good though because it can remove tone variants and make you sound just a little bit too consistent or robotic. But a little bit is absolutely worth it. And by the way, I tend to not have a lot of tone variants. Uh, in my older courses, I did sound a little bit more robotic, but now I, you know, there is range here, right? I'm not an actor, but I can totally put my range like wherever I want to do, right? Just like that naturally. So that probably sounded pretty cringy, but you know what I mean. Now, uh, there's many other processor effects that you can do. Like you can add delay, pitch shifting, and dozens of other effects. But, you know, most of these are kind of like gimmicks. So when it comes to recording videos and podcasts, you know, you can always Google for that stuff later, but you're probably not going to use them. Uh, plus those gimmicky effects, which I'll play right now, so you can just uh, have some fun here and, and listen to what they sound like. This is what happens when a neck beard plays with sound effects. Isn't this, isn't this fun? fun? <laughs> yep, that was pretty fun for sure. And uh, they could be fun from time to time, but... Usually you would just do them in software afterwards, right? You're not going to be like 
turning knobs on their processor in real time as you're recording. Uh, typically, you just leave those knobs how they are and you just record. Also, as a quick aside, you know, just having some fun with uh, gimmicky effects. I once added an echo effect into my Dive Into Docker course when talking about the echo command, which you can hear now. Next up, the echo, echo command just, just prints this sentence, sentence to the terminal. terminal. I thought that was pretty fun, but uh, you know, it makes a difference, right? Like about 10 people, they've emailed me specifically just to say like, hey, that was really nice how you just added that echo uh, part for that one sentence, right? It just adds like a little bit of polish. So that is the basic rundown on preamps and processors. So let's go over one really good one. Uh, that is the DBX286S, preamp and processor. That's what we're looking at here. So that's the one that I use. Uh, depending on the time of day, it could be 200 bucks to 20, something like that. And you can either rack mount it or just have it sit flush on your desk. I'm gonna show a screenshot in a second of the thing actually sitting on my desk. You know, that this, this is a stock photo over here. Now, I did spend a lot of hours researching this category. You know, I must have watched at least 50 assorted YouTube videos and read hundreds of forum posts. And a lot of people seem to like this one and now I see why. Right, it comes with a pretty good preamp and it has way more than enough power for the AT2005. But if you're using the Shure SM7B, it's gonna be pretty close. So I've never used this mic firsthand, but uh, you might wanna look into using something called the Cloud Lifter if you happen to get this mic because that is going to give you a very clean 25 decibels a gain. Uh, I haven't tried this personally, right? Uh, but the DBX on its own might be good enough. Uh, typically, if it's not quite enough power, things are gonna sound a little bit muddled or a little bit uh, you know, flappy, I guess, is one way to describe it. It's just not gonna sound really clear and nice. So you may need to experiment with that. But uh, you don't need to worry about the cloud lifter or whatever with the AT2005. But uh, the cool thing about the DBX is it comes with a compressor, a de-esser, a basic EQ, and a noise gate. There's also lights on it to see how everything works. I'll try to get the screenshot there, right? So we can read and see at the same time. And uh, once you set these knobs to where they need to be, you don't have, you know you never have to worry about it again, right? The knobs are also very sturdy. Uh, they're not gonna just move around on their own like if you dust it or do something like that. Like you really need to put some effort to turn them, uh, which is quite nice. Uh, I wouldn't bother hunting around for another preamp or processor, but if you really, really wanted to, by all means, do more research. But uh, I feel like this one is pretty much as good as you're gonna get in this type of price point without going crazy. Uh, you may also not even need one at all, right? It really depends. We're going to go over that too. So here's the exact settings that I use here for this one. Uh, I took this straight from uh, just a camera shot, right? You can tell by the horrible shadows there. Uh, yeah, my camera is not very good. But these are the exact settings that I use. But, you know, this really, really, really is going to depend on what your room quality is like, what microphone you use, how you speak. So don't just blindly copy these settings because... Uh, they're just not going to work for you most likely unless you happen to have a very similar setup. Um, yeah, for most of these settings also, like lower is typically better, right? Besides the gain and whatnot. Like if you can not use this much of the noise gate, totally want to have that lower, that would be great. So now let's talk a little bit about wires, right? We can't. We handled USB interfaces. We handled maybe using a processor. Uh, we have microphones and headphones or and like how do we wire all this stuff up together? And this really is going to depend on what you buy, but we'll go over a whole bunch of different combos. So let's say that you decide just to hook up the AT2005 or another USB mic straight to your computer. Well, good news there is you don't need anything else then most likely, right? You can just put that straight to your computer. You can just use the wire that comes with the mic, but maybe, you know, maybe double check the wire length, right? To see if you need an extension cable or not. Then there's a Scarlett 2i2 or the Solo, right? I'll probably do like slash Solo there just so you know. Uh, this comes with its own USB-C to A cable, but again, yeah, it's only three feet or roughly one meter. Uh, it's a lot shorter than you would expect and this is the thing that needs to connect to your computer. So, you know, if your computer case is on the floor, then this wire is not gonna really reach the top of your desk. You're gonna have to put it like on top of your case, which wouldn't be ideal, maybe next to it on the floor. It's a little bit weird. So I ended up getting uh, this Amazon Basics USB-C to USB-A nine foot cable. It was 12 bucks, totally worth it. I, I do recommend not going longer because uh, you do risk a little bit of signal loss there, right? Even if you can get away with a shorter cable, like six feet, you might wanna look into that. Probably would be okay if you don't have a standing desk, but I do have a standing desk and the cord needs to basically be pretty long. Uh, as for an XLR cable, uh, the one I used, um, it just comes with the AT2005, so you don't need to worry about it. But if you do need to buy one, this Hosa XLR microphone cable, uh, 10 feet, 15 bucks, totally worth getting, uh, not a bad idea at all. So Hosa is a really good brand for audio cables. Don't know if I'm pronouncing that one correctly. That's the first time I've actually ever pronounced it, but lots of folks do recommend them. Uh, I do use them for a different cable, which we're about to go over now. Uh, yeah, it was really good. So a lot of people say, you know, like the more expensive cables, uh, this XLR one, 15 bucks, you know, there are more expensive ones out there, but you're really paying for mostly durability, right? Like if you're, uh, 
you know, at a concert rate and constantly plugging and unplugging and moving them around, then maybe get a different one. But if it's just sitting in your room, then yeah, this one is fine. And if you're not using the DBX, uh, you can just connect your mic straight into the front of the Scarlett 2i2 with that XLR cable. Uh, now, if you do have the Scarlett 2i2 or Solo and the DBX 286S, then you will need that one XLR cable, right? Either use the one that came with the AT2005 or buy one. Uh, but you will also need another cable, which is this Hosa quarter inch TRS balanced 10 foot cable. So the way this connection will work is you have your microphone and you're going to connect the XLR, uh, XLR cable, which is going to be, you know, at the bottom of the mic usually. That is going to connect to the back of the DBX286S. I'm actually going to throw a screenshot up now in the video so you can take a look at that. Then from the back of that uh, DBX286S, you're going to take that TRS cable and then connect that to the front of the Scarlett 2i2. Again, I will throw up a, a screenshot to take a look. Then finally, you will take the Scarlett 2i2 and connect its USB cable from the back straight into your computer over a USB port. Uh, it should work on both USB 2 or 3. Uh, I believe I have mine hooked up to a USB 3, but don't quote me on that one. Anyways, the TRS cable one is pretty interesting because you wouldn't think that actually plugs into the front of the Scarlett, but uh, it does. And that XLR jack in the front is made for both XLR and TRS connections. As far as I know, again, I'm not an audio engineer here. I'm just a software developer who did some research. The actual cable is the same. Uh, XLR versus TRS is just the connector type. And then also, if you happen to use a cloud lifter, you know, again, I don't use this personally, just in case you're skipping around. But uh, if you happen to get one, then it is going to go in between your mic and the DBX. Basically, you want it as early as possible, right? Like straight out of your mic to boost it before it goes into the DBX or the Scarlet and things like that. Uh, you will need to buy one more extra XLR cable. Uh, the other one linked before is totally fine. If you don't have a DBX, then uh, it can just go in between the mic and the Scarlet. Now, let's talk a little bit about software. And we're not going to spend a huge amount of time here. Uh, this is mainly just to bring an awareness to why you might choose to do things with hardware or maybe how you can avoid all hardware besides a USB mic and do all your processing through software. It's really going to depend on what you're doing. So the first thing is figuring out what your priorities are and your lifestyle. So if you're always on the move, then lugging around a whole bunch of hardware probably isn't worth it, right? Especially if you're a light packer. You know, dedicating like a 30-year backpack to a carefully packed Scarlett 2i2 and a DBX and a microphone and cables and all this other stuff uh, doesn't seem worth it, right? But if you do plan to record in one location, then the hardware option might be worth it. So let's first actually break down a couple of scenarios where you might want high quality audio, right? This is live st streaming to Twitch or YouTube, maybe a live talk over Zoom or equivalent for an interview, code pairing, etc. Maybe it's a pre-recorded video for YouTube or maybe you record courses, right? You have some chance to edit the video before it goes out. Then you also have pre-recorded podcast, right? Because if you did one over live, it's probably going to be done over Twitch or YouTube. But a pre-recorded podcast is what I have, right? We jump on a call, we talk, and then I edit it and it goes out. And then lastly, we have things like calling your friend with whatever app that you decide to use, right? Google Meet, Skype, etc., etc. Now, uh, I could argue and say that you could technically use software to do all of that, and you won't need any hardware at all, you know, especially if you have a really quiet room. But before you address hardware versus software processing, let's talk a little bit how you might record your video and or audio, because that really plays a big role here. And some of these tools are going to be free, some are going to be paid. And that begins with OBS, which is the Open Broadcaster Software. It's free, open source, cross-platform. And uh, it's really, really good for live streaming and recording. It also has a ton of options for audio effects like a noise gate and more. And you can apply all that stuff in real time, even for live streams. You can even use VST plugins. These are basically highly optimized audio plugins written to work with many different applications. You know, there's a bunch of free VST plugins that provide various processor effects if you Google around, you know, things like delay and compressors and stuff like that. But uh, chances are the built-in filters that come with OBS are going to be good enough if you decide to use uh, software processing. Now, what's really nice about this setup with OBS is once you have everything dialed in, that's it, you're done. It's basically like hardware. You don't need to you know, do stuff every time you decide to record a video. Uh, honestly, I record all of my videos using OBS, but I don't use it for processing, right? I just use it for the recording. This video you're watching right now is recording on OBS. It's a really great tool for recording your screen and live streaming, uh, you know, also with a webcam if you want. Uh, yeah, it's a really good setup. Now, this is very specific to people making videos, but Camtasia and ScreenFlow, these are both a video recording and editing tools. So they're really useful for creating any type of like pre-recorded videos where you're recording your screen with a webcam optionally, 
And, uh, you know, they come with a couple of audio filters too. So Camtasia works on Windows and Mac OS, whereas ScreenFlow is only Mac OS only. Uh, I do use Camtasia to edit all my videos, but I don't do any processing with it when it comes to audio. But it does make it really painless to do stuff like noise reduction, right? That's their term or maybe noise cancellation, something like that. Basically their noise gate, right? It's a checkbox that you click and like 10 seconds later, it's applied. Uh, it's really easy to set up. Uh, but for me personally, all I do is import the videos and then I just uh, go and edit them with Camtasia. Now I heard ScreenFlow and I don't have a Mac, so I haven't tested this. It might even be better for audio processing because it supports VSD plugins, whereas Camtasia does not. But if all you're doing is removing noise and maybe adding a very light compressor, which Camtasia does have, by the way, you can level out your track, uh, then maybe Camtasia will be good enough. Um, Again, you know, this is not a video on comparing video editing tools. Both of these are pretty good. Uh, in both cases, you know, you'll find yourself applying whatever audio effects you need to every track, which gets a little bit annoying. Um, but you can always record with OBS and then just edit it with Camtasia or ScreenFlow instead. And then you bypass that issue altogether. Then there is uh, DaVinci Resolve. This is free and they have a paid version as well. And this is a video editing tool. It has a ton of fantastic audio processing capabilities too. Uh, as well as being like a really good video editor as well. Uh, I'd like to switch to using it instead of Camtasia to edit my videos, but my workstation just doesn't agree with it when it comes to video editing, but uh, kind of goes beyond the scope of this video. In any case though, if it runs well, then uh, yeah, it's a really good tool. I actually do edit all my podcasts on it because the way it visualizes the waveform, basically the visual representation of sound, it really makes it very easy to zoom in and cut things around. Uh, it's a great tool for modifying audio. Then there's Audacity, which is another free and open source cross-platform tool. Uh, this is the tool I use to record my podcast, and it's also what I recommend to guests because it's pretty easy to get going. Basically, we each record our side of the conversation locally, and then we use Zoom just to chat in real time, but we never use the Zoom recording for the actual podcast. Uh, Audacity has a whole bunch of different audio processing capabilities. Uh, it's really good, honestly, just for basic recording. I wouldn't bother doing that much with it when it comes to audio effects because you do need to apply it to everything and record, and it gets a little bit tedious. Um, as for the podcast, you know, I just import these directly into DaVinci Resolve and edit the podcast there. For my track, I just leave it alone because everything comes in good from the hardware. But for the guest track, it's always different because it depends on their mic setup. They're all using uh, various things, but usually it just uh, becomes using a noise gate, compressor, and so on. I've got things set up to where in about 15 seconds, I can finish cleaning up all their audio. It's not really too bad at all. So now the real question, right? Like, should you use hardware or software processing? And really it depends on what you're doing. Uh, I feel like in OBS or with OBS, a lot of that stuff can be done in an equally convenient way as hardware. In other words, you don't need to spend a lot of time uh, adjusting every video you record. Now, if you have a decent computer, it's not going to be an issue to do this in software. You know, even if you're streaming most video games, I bring that up here because, you know, when you do it at the software level, your computer is doing all this processing work instead of a dedicated piece of hardware. And audio latency is a very noticeable thing. You know, even something as little as 10 milliseconds would be noticeable for a speaking voice. It's going to throw you off. And I can go down to single digit milliseconds for instruments. Uh, but CPUs and other electronics found in modern day computers are really, really good. So if you're doing that small amount of compression along with uh, a noise gate and not too much else, and you're also recording your screen with a webcam, I think you'll be fine on most modern computers. I know my workstation did all that no problem, and I built that thing from parts way back in 2014. Uh, the only time where hardware really wins is if you want to jump on, you know, like an ad hoc call with someone using Zoom or some other app, right? Your audio quality is just going to be great out of the box with the hardware because you don't need to set anything up. Whereas uh, if you're using software, it's really going to depend on what that application does. You know, again, that might be okay since the demand for high quality audio really isn't uh, that much if you're just talking to a friend or giving an occasional talk on the internet, right? Because you got to think too, um, when you're dealing with something over the internet, like Zoom or whatever, all the audio is going over the network and that's really not going to sound amazing anyways. So, you know, that's as an aside, by the way, why I do all my podcasting with local tracks. Um, and there's another option here too, right? To make software also work for ad hoc calls. Now, technically you can even install a virtual audio interface at the OS level, right? On Mac, Linux, Windows, etc. And then you can process your audio in real time through software using a digital audio workstation such as we Reaper uh, that is free to try out. And then you can send the output of that to any app that you want. So basically the output uh, becomes your microphone input through that vir virtual audio interface. So uh, what I'm trying to say here is you would basically connect your mic to Reaper, do all your noise gate compression, et cetera, et cetera. 
then to send the output of that to the virtual device. And then that virtual device becomes your microphone that you then use in whatever app that you want. So this is actually what I used to do way back in 2015. Uh, but you know, as you can see, it's a little bit convoluted. It's tedious as hell to set up because you have to get all these things wired up and then patch them in every time you use any of these apps. And it got really annoying. So that's why I got the hardware I did, right? It's so I can just set everything up once, use my microphone in any app and not have to worry about any of that stuff. Because at the time, OBS really wasn't as good as it was today, or is today. Uh, so if I were starting from scratch uh, with, a, with what I know now, I'd at least begin with the AT2005 USB, nothing else, and just hook it up straight up to my computer and then use OBS to record or stream everything. And uh, I would go from there, right? I would play it by ear. If I did want, uh, you know, a little bit more hardware, maybe the Scarlett or the DBX, then I would introduce them as, uh, as needed. I wouldn't necessarily start with them right away. Cool. So... Now we are basically at the end here, right? Audio levels, uh, we're almost there. We have the room, we have background noise under control. We figured out what we wanna do with hardware and software. We're almost set. Uh, the last step is to make sure your audio is set for a specific loudness. For example, sound is measured in decibels, right? It's really common to keep your recordings around negative 10 dB in their levels. That's going to be loud enough that folks with a whole bunch of different devices can hear it uh, comfortably and you stay clear of going past zero dB. Anything above zero dB is gonna uh, start clipping and sound very distorted. So typically what you do is you adjust the gain on your mic, preamp and software, until you see your bars jump around to about negative 10. You know, maybe you can peak at about negative six. And really, honestly, if you go a little bit louder, let's say negative three dB, that's totally fine. Just make sure you're under zero and you are consistent. You know, this is something that you'll want to experiment with until you get used to your voice and you know what levels it produces with whatever gear and processing effects that you have applied. Uh, for playback, you know, just remember that not everyone is going to be using high quality headphones with a dedicated preamp. What sounds painfully loud for you might actually be normal for some folks. So have trust in the decibel numbers, right? If you go too low, then folks with low powered earbuds or speakers, they're not even gonna be able to hear you uh, even at 100% volume, and that's going to really kill your recording. Whereas you with, uh, you know, really high quality headphones, you can always just lower your playback volume, which is independent recording, so that uh, you don't blow out your eardrums. Also stay safe there, right? Don't listen to stuff at very high volumes all the time. And uh, finally, to wrap this up, right, practice, 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 right? Uh, once you have everything dialed in and under control, nothing really beats just uh, recording a whole bunch of stuff, figuring out your patterns and your microphone's characteristics. You know, eventually uh, you'll figure out what works and what doesn't work, but at least now you know what to tweak. Uh, needless to say, right, audio in general is a really, really deep rabbit hole. And it uh, can also get pretty addicting, right, to always tinker with your settings and your gear. Uh, I highly recommend finding what works for you. You know, keep it at that until you have a real reason to switch and then maybe switch to something else. But chances are maybe you can roll with what you have for uh, quite some time. And uh, that is going to wrap up this video. I know that was a long one, hour and a half video. I can't believe it's that long. But I uh, hope you enjoyed it. It was really fun writing this and recording this. Uh, this is definitely the longest post I ever made. One of the longest videos for sure. On that note, if you have any questions or uh, want to leave like some of your favorite recording tips in the comments below, I would love to hear that. Uh, thanks a lot for watching. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up because it really helps. And I will see you in the next video.